So our story uh, started pretty early. Um, Demonware has been around for over 20 years, uh, providing services to games. Um, I think, like, be they, Activision acquired them, so they were providing games before that. But um, we originally just ran on bare metal. Um, it was quite normal back then to do that. Um, as time progressed and the internet grew, we had to change how we did things. So we introduced sharding to our bare metal databases and it worked for a while. Um, as time went on and our catalog grew, we had to adapt. So we thought, hey, why don't we you know, use uh, KVM and LXC to build, you know, make it more flexible and, and give us the, uh, you know, build an orchestration layer in there and, and make it more manageable. And that, that was good. Um, until, yeah, we hit thousands of databases and then it became kind of unmanageable. Um, so we started building something on top of that, which um, managed the connections and managed the uh, failovers and the errors and, and all that. And it worked, but uh, yeah, we, we uh, were kind of, you know, still like a little bit stressed by it. So as we... Uh, continued through there, we investigated um, some different, you know, things and, and it came that uh, we kind of like figured out the challenges that we were looking for. So Vlad is going to talk about that. Yeah, we started seeing multiple operational issues, which uh, were uh, challenges for us when we, when we started to uh, find solutions, how to fix them. Uh, what we did is we worked with multiple service teams and we identified few key areas uh, of the issues that those teams were seeing. First area was around scalability. Um, Activision launches uh, several AAA uh, game titles every year. Um, a game launch is a very important event for us where um, many millions players will show up at the same date uh, around the same time and this is um, maybe a very pleasant problem to have for a business but it's a very big technical challenge to to solve um, to have a smooth experience uh, for the uh, game launch we prepare many months before and we spend a lot of time low testing, low testing how uh, the new game client behaves, what are the new workloads that, were, that we are seeing from the new game title. But we also try to predict how many players will show up on the, on the launch date. Um, it's not always possible to predict um, exactly how many players will show up. So. Um, we, what we tend to do is we uh, over, overbuilt our uh, database uh, platform to handle any potential peak that we might be seeing during, during the launch. You would think as, as the time goes and uh, the workload decreases after game is launched, uh, you would think that we, we would decrease the, the capacity of the database to, in order to save resources. That sounds logical. Uh, it's not that easy though. Um, we were able to scale out our database in a certain hacky way, but um, we weren't really able to um, scale down without having a significant player impact. That's why we actually never, or like, very long time ago uh, scaled down our database after after we we had launched another scalability issue which i would mention is about co connections uh, since our um, application layer uh, has no um, database connection pooling at all um, we were seeing databases running with more than 10,000 connections which was extremely painful f and uh, was causing um, MySQL performance issues uh, related to CPU and, um, and the memory. Another area is about operational burden. Um, 
at our scale, uh, we see failures, hardware failures happening every day. Um, those affect databases. Uh, we had quite thorough automation in place to uh, automatically re remediate uh, a primary failover. So like if, if MySQL primary went down, the, it would have been automatically uh, failed over to one of the replicas. But still there was a lot of operational overhead for on-call that had to run a manual Ansible automation to replace missing MySQL node. Um, we run on premise, we run in, in a data center that um, we've rarely seen large scale issues with, but I'm not saying like we haven't had any issues. Uh, we, we had few large scale uh, like infra failures that resulted in, in many, many um, uh, engineering hours uh, to fix um, broken MySQL replicas. What we saw is that uh, um, MySQL replicas, at least in, in our case, um, uh, broke in a, in a ways that uh, they couldn't, couldn't have been used as the, as the new potential primaries. We just had to replace them and we had to replace several hundreds of such broken replicas. So, if such thing happened, it was extremely painful. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we were lacking a robust scaling solution. Uh, we were somewhat, we were able to scale out, but only by a doubling number of shards. That was not ideal because uh, scaling by doubling is probably not very, uh, resource efficient if you just want to add only, let's say, 10%. The last area which we identified was about the setup complexity. Um, um, Demonware operates in multiple um, platform and service teams. Uh, service teams uh, own their own uh, database operations. Um, as such, um, each team is required to have at least certain level of database operations experience. Um, that's not always true for every team um, and some teams were delayed by, by this because they, they had to wait for, basically they had to wait for help from other teams. Uh, database large scale database build out and we are talking about the database with over 100 charts took very long time it took between two and three days and uh, this was not acceptable for um, development agility when you wanted to iterate on the database quickly when you wanted to change configuration try different things drop database build database uh, um, it was delaying us uh, schema migrations were also hard to execute by certain teams. Uh, those required high experience running database in production. They required very careful planning and execution. So that often uh, led to delays in, um, in development workflows. And that led us to finding a solution that would address these key areas. So yeah, the next um, section is the tech adoption. So uh, I ran the tech adoption for Vitesse test at Demonware. Um, yeah, so we started by doing a next gen DB evaluation. We set a bunch of criteria. This is, you know, six of them, but I think we had a hundred in the, in the spreadsheet and we, kind of went through many different uh, products. Um, all of them were working at some level, but um, we decided that uh, the, the, the major things that we wanted were the SQL query compatibility, um, so that the application didn't really have to change anything. Um, 
we wanted it to run MySQL on the back end if possible. Uh, we were currently, when we started this, we were uh, looking at our platform and we were saying, okay, well, everything is kind of moving towards Kubernetes internally in the company. So it would be nice if we found something that was Kubernetes native. Um, a bonus feature would be that it provides an operator. Uh, after taking these all into account, we evaluated and uh, yeah, the test came out as a pretty clear winner. Um, when we started the adoption process post, um, you know, t testing and, and, you know, that we uh, discovered that the test was a near drop in replacement for um, most of the services that we had targeted. Um, one of the things that was great about it was that we had a bunch of MySQL expertise on staff. Uh, those people, when we, you know, had problems, we could just be like, hey, we're seeing this thing, like what's going on? And 99% of the time it, it wasn't like a problem with the test. It was like, you know, oh, hey, we can change this or do this this way and it was fine. Um, another big thing was that there were a lot of success stories from other companies, uh, just kind of like in the community we, we, we heard about. Um, we start, you know, we joined the, um, the test Slack and, you know, random people would come out and, and see us asking questions and just be like, hey, you know, what's going on? And, you know, I reached out to a bunch of people just like, oh, I see you asking questions. So it, it was a pretty lively um, community. Um, so we'll get like, we're, we'll, we're going to talk about two main parts of the adoption. Um, the small service, uh, which was a, a social service um, that uh, was not critical path and a large service, which was fairly business critical. So I ran the um, first track um, of the small service uh, where we were doing a lot of platform things and Vlad ran the large service. So small service wise, why we chose it, it, uh, well, like the backstory of this is actually a little bit different. So we d had targeted to do a large service and we we're like, okay, well, if we can do our most complex service, then we can do any service. And as time progressed, we were like, no, no, no that's, that's actually not going to work. So we, uh, we, we, I was actually walking on the seawall in Vancouver with one of my coworkers and he was like, why don't you take, you know, the, the, our group service and just like, you know, it's new, it's, it's, it, it doesn't have any data, you know, just use that. And I was like, yeah, okay, let's, let's do that. So like a few days later, we'd, we'd started working on it. Um, we got to start with fresh data, which was quite nice. We didn't have to do a migration. Um, as I mentioned in the previous uh, slide, it, it wasn't in the critical login path. So if something did happen with it um, during the proof of concept, it wasn't going to block players from logging in. Um, another feature of it was it was very easy to make architectural changes to it. So we didn't end up making that many architectural changes, but you know we we made some, and it uh, it was much easier to do to a service that was not in production at the time. Um, what this did, though, was give us an opportunity to see what a, a service would look like running uh, on our Kubernetes platform. So we had to do a lot of work with, um, you know, how volumes were managed, how, you know, the, the pod disruption budgets, the, you know, work all of those things out. Like, we couldn't just go say, hey, you know, we're going to run the test on our Kubernetes cluster because that, I mean, that just, it, it wasn't going to work. So we, we spent a bit of time building this and integrating it into our, into our platform. Uh, which built a good baseline for uh, other services. Uh, so the timeline, uh, when we first started looking at this, for V0, we, we weren't very serious about adopting it at the time. Um, we kind of were like, hey, we should build a proof of concept. Like there was a few engineers and we were like, we should build a proof of concept of this and, and see what it looks like running. Um, so we were like, if we're going to build this, uh, you know, and, and move it into our Kubernetes platform, maybe we build it parallel to what we have now, see how it runs, and then migrate that into the Kubernetes platform. Uh, we didn't get super far with that. So we started doing it, we got it running, but it just didn't seem like it wasn't, there was no magic moment. Um, so a little bit of time passed and we were taking it a little more seriously. And we moved to a V1, which was using the now deprecated Helm charts and uh, on our Kubernetes platform. And I think we kind of had like that magic moment where it was like, okay, this, this works. And, you know, we, we were, we started, we had tied this uh, setup into the small service that I was talking about. We had run queries against it. We had done even, I believe some like minor load tests and we were like, okay, this is, this is, this is real. 
And um, as we continued, we were like, okay, now we need to figure out like these operational burdens and the, the other things that we we're talking about, you know, what, how are we gonna deal with that? So the Helm chart was working good, but we just, you know, it was missing something. So we decided to be early adopters of the operator, which, um, you know, it was, it, it, it worked out of the box. Um, it was, it was, you know, we could just throw our cluster definition in and we had a, a uh, working um, system there. Uh, it still, it was, it was great. And we were like, okay, this is like almost on par with what we have like right now, but it's still like, we, like why this, this feels like a, a vertical move and not a, a like a, an upgrade. So we decided to be, I, we may have been one of the first um, adopters of VTorque, which um, we were, we were, we were confused at how well it worked. Um, we were doing bad things to clusters and it just wouldn't, it wouldn't die. So uh, we ended up shipping with our, this V3 into production uh, for both the small service and the large service. And uh, yeah. So the proof of concept, uh, how it actually went was it was uh, it, like the previous slide with the timeline. Um, it was pretty slow to start because there was a lot of different ways we could do things. Um, there was a lot of you know, it, it felt like it wasn't just something you could Google because there was not really anybody that, you know, was, was running it like how we were running it. And we had a lot of, you know, platform requirements. Um, it turned out that our platform team was great and they ended up, um, you know, helping quite a bit and it went pretty smoothly. Um, once we had it like fully working and everything, we started on the testing of the small service and it was ruthless because this is when the people come out of the woodwork and they're like, what about this small edge case? Like what, you know, what's going to happen when this happens? And it's like, yeah, I can, I think this. And they're like, have you tested it? And I'm like, no. So there was a lot of edge case testing, which, which turned out to be very helpful. Um, at the end, um, we ended up testing uh, shard expansion <clears throat> uh, up and down during uh, one of the uh, larger betas um, and it worked flawlessly for us. Uh, we did vertical scaling. We tested that, adding CPUs, adding memory, no issues. And we did a lot of recovery and uh, error handling testing, just deleting, sh deleting shards, deleting parts of shards, deleting everything, bringing it back. And it was, it was uh, the first time it happened, I actually did it accidentally. And then I went to the washroom and came back and I was like, why is this still running? I deleted it. And I was like looking in my history and looking at the events. And I was like, okay, this is I was like, I didn't realize that it, the backups were something that were automatically triggered when the, anyways, uh, it was, it was unexpected, but uh, like quite nice. Um, <clears throat> we started the load testing and it went uh, pretty well. And, uh, you know, during all of this, we started building quite good relationships with the open source community. Um, it was, uh, you know, really, really helpful uh, to have them. They, they helped out a lot. Um, and then we launched. Uh, and it was so successful that nobody talked about it um, until January when they were like, okay, we're gonna look at a much bigger service here and we're gonna try and uh, implement it for that, which Vlad was mainly working on and he will take over. Uh, we had very great experience from adoption on this small, small service, as Greg mentioned. Um, we were thinking, okay, what's next? Um, what are our biggest pain? Uh, what's our biggest pain and where, which service uh, has that biggest pain? So we were absolutely clear about that we, we are continuing with a, a large business critical service, which you may think like, oh, that's, that's really crazy. Like you, you just finished your small scale adoption. Like why are you picking the business critical service. Well, um, the main reason was that we just recently finished execution of um, manual scaling operation that had been very stressful and painful operation that uh, took several sleepless nights to finish and we, we had committed ourselves that we don't want to repeat those nights again and we want to fully automate the uh, next scaling operation for this large service um, what we picked we picked 
what we call inventory service. What is this service doing? It stores, it mainly stores player items. So you can think of inventory of what a player owns in the game. Uh, examples would be guns, attachments, like various modifications. Uh, there are like even things that you would not really consider to be uh, items. Uh, so like anything in the game that can be related to a player and it's, it's in, in a way granted by certain achievements. It's huge, that database is huge. Uh, I'm not saying like we've reached these numbers in one year, like it, it, was, over a f uh, it was over a few years, but uh, at recent launch, this database saw uh, peak requests at half million requests per second. Um, and the data size has been a pain too. Uh, we are seeing nearly two times increase in size every two years, which makes a like additional challenge up to on top of uh, of the request rate that that we are seeing. Um, how we tackle this? Uh, we identified few adoption, high level adoption stages. Um, we knew that it's not gonna be easy. This, this service has been around for uh, more than eight years. It's a big monolith application with very complex business, uh, business logic, uh, full of transactions, uses foreign keys in the database. Uh, so we knew that uh, it's gonna take some time to, to get there and if, if possible. What we were trying to define is what actually an MVP for an existing service would mean in our case of adoption VTES. So we, we came up of a definition of uh, core uh, core, core functionality of uh, of the service that we that we needed to be running on Vitas. It sounds easy. You identify okay, this is important to my application, but how how do you confirm that like such thing actually runs without any disruptions on on your new database? Fortunately, we had a very good uh, unit and integration test coverage. So we, we decided, yeah, why don't we use those tests to, to confirm that, uh, that our integration works on VTES. Initially, when we ran our first attempt, uh, it looked scary. Um, about 50% of the tests were failing and we were really, uh, I'm not saying like, we were not ready to give up, but it felt overwhel overwhelming. Um, what we did is we we tried to like obviously you and oh I, I need to mention that uh, it's about four thousand unit tests that this uh, that this uh, service has, and like when you have two thousand tests failing, uh, you won't go one by one. Uh, instead, we try to find like similarities, uh, like why these tests are failing, and and we 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 were slowly coming up with like similar patterns and uh, similar issues, um, and we were able to group these unit tests into few smaller set of issues, and we started tackling the problem of of adaptation uh, in a in a more systematic way. Uh, MVP, MVP took about two months to finish. Um, we were able to uh, resolve all these issues that we that we set ourselves for this uh, basic MVP. And along this way, we we found ourselves stuck a few times where. Where, as as Greg mentioned earlier, it was it was really great experience uh, for us to work with the community. Uh, 
we want to share what we learned all, all, along the way. Uh, and we are mentioning only like few uh, incompatible, few SQL incompatibilities or a different behavior, which which was not necessary a blocker for us, but like it required some, I would say, minor work to. Uh, to update our application code. Um, uh, the first one that I'm, that I'm showing here is about the MySQL named logs. Um, the application was full of them. Uh, we were having multiple places where we needed to stay synchronized to protect the data and stay consistent. Uh, what we learned with Vitesse was that uh, the, at least with version 14, uh, that's what we are um, still using in production. Um, Vitesse implements named logs using the first shard, which uh, turned out to be, a, I'm not saying like a blocker, but a potential uh, performance bottleneck. What we did was to look around at these places and we, um, we updated the application code to uh, reduce number of um, logs that we are acquiring per second. Another one uh, is about the foreign keys. I mentioned that the application is full of them. Um, tables use uh, foreign key constraints to implement certain business, business rules and uh, Vitesse does not um, does not fully support the foreign keys. Like uh, it doesn't mean they don't work. They 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 do for us and they do and they work well. It's just certain um, scenarios where um, um, things were failing for us, and actually it was only one, which was about uh, when when we were scaling, so adding adding more shards. Um, the operation was was failing uh, on those foreign key checks when the database schema was being created. We worked around it by temporarily disabling the foreign key checks on the, the target new shards. Um, uh, this didn't put data into any risk because uh, the the new shards were not, not receiving live data at that moment. So um, we felt absolutely safe about this workaround we, we, we had chosen. Um, last one, but yeah, mm, these are just examples is, uh, for example, replace into uh, was heavily used in our um, data layer abstraction in, in, the, in the application. And uh, we, um, the, the problem was that uh, replace into statement by definition requires all columns to be included, which means that you had to include even shard key, but you just can't update shard key in a sharding solution because that, that would just mean that you are expecting to, to data to start moving between different shards. That's, that's just doesn't make sense. Um, so, like, it made made sense why this is not supported, but we had to update uh, our uh, application to to work to work uh, again. And what we did, we we just simply switched to using insert in, uh, insert on duplicate, and that worked. We continued with uh, with load testing. We we needed to uh, feel confident that uh, the new database solution will handle the traffic that we ex expect uh, on the on the game launch. Uh, what we 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 already had like a lot of experience from the previous years with uh, load testing MySQL workloads. Uh, so we we knew that. Uh, MySQL is behind, so like we don't really need to focus on those parts. Like instead, we focused on the uh, VTS components that were new to us. So we, we are basically trying to confirm that uh, that VTS components that are on the request path, on the query path, uh, that they uh, scale um, scale linearly with uh, adding more shards, and that we would not hit any performance bottleneck. 
Um, we basically confirmed those assumptions. Um, we, what we also learned is that um, the new solution will require uh, some additional CPU resources, which was kind of expected. We, like anytime you, you run like additional proxy somewhere or s like sidecars to your applications, like of course it, it will take more resources, uh, but the, the benefits that we were about to get from the, the new platform uh, much more outweighed the additional uh, re resources that, that we were bringing into the platform. So what we learned is that uh, uh, the component, which is a sidecar uh, to the MySQL runs on the data nodes, uh, requires about, the at least in our case, um, requires about the same CPU resources as the MySQL process itself. Uh, that was kind of surprise to us, but um, we were also positively um, surprised by the fact that, uh, that the connection pooling that is provided by Vitesse uh, greatly offsets um, CPU utilization that is uh, that is on the MySQL process itself. So the, the fact that we were not having over 10,000 connections on the My, MySQL process anymore. So we, we went from 10,000, 15,000 to something around 300, 400 connections per database. That greatly helped to uh, for MySQL to, to start breeding again. Uh, we were done with the load testing, uh, so all our expectations were uh, um, were confirmed. Uh, so we we went to the last stage where we we needed to prove that we will be able to operate the new database at scale, and that uh, yeah, that the that the database remains stable uh, after cert in, in certain uh, failure scenarios. So, we already we already did like a lot of failure testing before and during the small service adoption. But we we continued further. We went even more aggressive. So we again we were doing very bad things to the database and. Uh, um, it was always able to recover, uh, which which was magical. We very much uh, focused on configuration deployment testing. So what we 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 really wanted to make sure that uh, changing a database configuration it is should be seen by people as a normal change. As you would be changing configuration to your application, that seemed to, to be a like huge difference compared to the past where we, where we felt like, oh, database is something precious that you are not touching if you really absolutely really don't have to touch. We wanted to change this model. So we, we really wanted to be able or to enable not even like database operations people to run run this uh, run this configuration changes. As a result of this work, we came up uh, with uh, tuned Vitesse configuration that, uh, that we are mentioning few features that we used, and um, yeah, uh, it was stable. Um, what I would like to highlight uh, on this slide is uh, the, the key points. What, what, we, what, what has changed? Um, we went from shards defined in the application configuration. So we, we had pretty much every, uh, every shard defined in the config. Uh, we, we went to a single database endpoint where the shards are abstract to the to the application. Uh, since previously, since um, 
shards were defined in the config uh, that in past that allowed us to make certain assumptions when we were designing database queries. Some queries were just too shard aware and there were like implicit assumptions they are just that you are working just with the being with a single shard data uh, such kind of queries were uh, not running um, efficiently with Vitesse at the like at the first stage but when we learn that we just need to we just need to give a hint Vitesse that hey like you need to you need to target a specific shard by just like including um, including a where condition that helps uh, Vitesse Query Planner to to route your query to just one or subset of the shards instead of all of them. Where we spent a bit of time was uh, figuring out how to expire data with Vitesse. Uh, Previously, we were hitting the shards uh, individually, and we were running uh, delete with limit on on uh, on the shards in a serial on a, or a parallel manner. Um, when you have a single database endpoint uh, and uh, shards are abstracted, uh, I guess that's the reason why why delete with limit is not supported by Vitesse because if you think about it like you you can't really identify which rows you really want to delete from those shards so it's it's just it made it makes total sense that it, it just can't be supported uh, for the safety safety reason what we did instead is uh, Vitesse still supports a way to talk to the shards individually, even though it, it's definitely not the best practice, but uh, that's what we had chosen to uh, to address this uh, this issue. And we, we kind of, in our like data layer, we implemented what we call shard walking, where we, where we do pretty much what we were doing before, but we do it with Vitesse now. All right, <clears throat> so yeah, we can, get some conclusions from all this information. Uh, so the benefits that we had, um, we now had tested it a bunch, tested it in production scenarios, and we had a very proven method of uh, sharding up and, <clears throat> and sharding down. Um, the shard tools were provided by the upstream of a test team, which is pretty great. Um, the on-call burden that, um, that we were talking about earlier was greatly reduced. Um, when we were creating these slides, I was thinking like, okay, there's going to be at least one escalation before this happens. But yeah, uh, to my knowledge, there has been no escalations to our production um, of a test cluster. The uh, operator and orchestrator have just kind of taken care of anything. So, but take this with a grain of salt. Like, <laughs> this, like if some, if you do do this and something happens, please don't blame me. Um, the uh, the database uh, setup um, is using our GitOps model, which the rest of the Kubernetes services are using. So uh, the rest of the company is quite happy with that. Um, yeah, it's it's uh, overall the the benefits have that we were looking for have been, you know, show like we can see them quite quite there. So um, I guess did it work? Yes, uh, it worked uh, to our expectations. Um, so much so that we we're building a team around supporting it. Uh, and currently there uh, were, I would say about one year into opening it up to multiple teams and there's about 60 separate Vitesse clusters running in our different environments. Um, and as of like, uh, I would say about two months ago, Vitesse has become the uh, default database solution for anything that we, uh, any new products. And a lot of our teams are uh, kind of jealous of the people running it. So they're starting to uh, talk about migrating their data into it. Uh, thank you for coming here. Uh, thank you to everyone at Demonware who helped uh, make this possible, and thank you to Planet Scale for helping us along the way. And yeah, if anybody has questions. I don't know where. How do you do it? Um, how does this work? We will. We will repeat the question. Yeah. Yes, we started fresh on both. So the, the thing was, was like we um, 
had an opportunity to start fresh. So right now, we're um, in our adoption process. We're we're figuring out the best ways to do data migrations. But it is, um, you know, it's different kind of for every service. So uh, yeah, we're 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 working on that right now, and it it looks quite promising. Uh, I think. Uh, hi, I was wondering uh, if you could speak a little, uh, you mentioned that you use Ceph, I don't know if, if everything is using Ceph, um, but if you could speak a little to the Ceph configuration and uh, what the performance is like on Ceph. Sure. Um, so, uh, yeah, he's asking what is the performance like on Ceph and what do we use Ceph for? So, um, we're, we initially just used Ceph um, for the etcd backing. Um, because it, the way that the operator had set it up, it was kind of expecting network storage. But then we were like, why don't we move less performant um, um, volumes into Ceph storage? So it uh, right now, I think we only have some test clusters running with the actual um, data-backed uh, Ceph, but it seems to be fine. Um, I don't think we will ever run any like high performance requirement stuff Ceph-backed, um, potentially just dev environments and, and um, some staging environments. Does that answer? Uh, yeah, so then I guess my follow-up question would be is what's the storage backend for like the prod, the test? Yeah, so we uh, we use local storage. So we have our own um, disk provisioner. Um, and I guess that this is actually the question that a lot of people who've talked to me have asked because they're like, how do you actually do this? We're trying to solve this. Um, yeah, we, we have an in-house thing that we use that just um, pre-provisions volumes and we just uh, create a PVC and, and it pulls it in. So each server has the PVs uh, available. And then we just say, hey, we want this PVC. And they're all pre-formatted. They're all everything. So it's uh, it's not very flexible, but it, it, it actually ended up working quite well because with the way we have it set up, we can um, cr – it's it's like – I'm calling it like persistent ephemeral, uh, persistently ephemeral. So, you know, we, we can um, treat the volumes as ephemeral volumes, but they're, they're quite persistent as well. Thank you. Hi. I have two if you have time. So first question is, are you using any high availability like primitives that Vitesse provides and like have you had any troubles with them? And the second is, when you scale the VT tablets, do you see any trouble with the time it takes the VT tablet to start and restore from a backup and the load is gone already? Uh, so the question was, uh, are we using any high availability tools like uh, cells and like multi-origins things of um no no okay. no for for, for the okay for that's, the, that's fine no for the multi-region but the uh, vitas itself has great high availability built-in mechanisms itself um so the proxy layer is is fully redundant you just keep adding replicas in, in the deployment. Uh, shard is highly available uh, by using MySQL replicas and uh, uh, VT org automatically fails over the, the primary to one of the chosen replicas. Um, the question about the tablet resizing, I think that that was the question. Yeah, I mean, like we use VT tablets and sometimes we have like load spikes, so we want to have more database, but by the time we restore like a terabyte of data, the spike is gone. So we need to vertically scale and I not horizontally it. scale. Yeah. If so you see something like that. So I think what greatly helps in our case is that we we use uh, CEF uh, that is uh, local in our network and is, is is extremely fast. I don't remember the the I think numbers. We're on, a hundred, we're on like a hundred uh, gigabit backbone, so we can just um, like pull it. It's very fast. And and what we also did to, I, I totally get your question because that was one of our uh, um, implementation requirements to, to make sure that, uh, that the replica gets recreated even with, uh, in, including catch-up, uh, MySQL uh, replication catch-up under 10 minutes. So like with this large scale database, the new replica gets up under 10 minutes. Thank you. Uh, I think we should cut it there, and um, if anybody has questions, just find us, um, and we will uh, be happy to talk. Thank you.